we are still in the midst of a celebration of the great feast of the Theophany. And the Christmas celebrations as a whole will not be over until the 2nd of February. So for a while, we'll still be enjoying some of that light that comes to us from the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, that long celebration of Christmas, that wasn't always the case in the ancient church. Church of Antioch, for example, in the first and second centuries, on January 7th, the day after the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ, began a fast. After all, did the scriptures not say that immediately upon his baptism, our Lord went off to the desert and celebrated 40, celebrated 40 days of fasting? So that fast, the fast of Jesus, one of the great fasts of the church, in the ancient church, had no connection or little connection with Pascha. Those of us who are this year surprised how late Lent is coming, Pascha itself, May 5th, uh, Lent occurring during March, but those of us in that ancient church would be right now in the midst of the Lenten celebration, for good or for ill. Uh, Theophany is one of the three great feasts of the church. Pascha, of course, is the feast of feasts. And then we can ask ourselves, well, is it Pentecost or Theophany? But either one of these feasts will do. Christmas is, by and large, a relatively new feast coming into the church. So in the ancient church, the church of the first and second centuries, there already had been established a liturgical week. Sunday was kept as the day of the celebration of the resurrection, which, of course, it still is. And Wednesdays and Fridays were kept as days of fasting, which they still are. Later on, some uh, churches in the East began to think it would be nice to center ourselves on a yearly celebration of the great events of our Lord's life, his incarnation, his passion, and his resurrection. Some of those churches, for good reason, they didn't simply uh, cast dice for this. Some of those churches began to celebrate this speech on March 25th. There were other churches in the East that began to celebrate this particular feast on uh, April 6th. Now, when the year of the church develops, we begin to think that in addition to one feast celebrate all the events of our Lord's life, it might be better to concentrate upon each particular event. So it happened that in those churches that chose March 25th, it became the date for the uh, conception of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you count forward nine months, you get December 25th, the day of the actual nativity. So it's not December 25th, that sets the date for March 25th, quite the contrary. Meantime, in some of the other churches in the East, uh, April 6th was the day for this all-around celebration of our Lord's life. And when these churches began to unpack that material, and they counted forward nine months from April 6th, they get January 6th. To this very day, and has nothing to do with Old or New Calvary. To this very day, the Armenian Church knows only one day of celebration of the events of our Lord's Nativity, and that's January 6th. So the Armenians, on the night before the 5th, commemorate the Nativity, on the 6th, the Baptism. We commemorate, somewhat later, uh, the presentation, the meeting of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Temple, counting 40 days from December 25th. The Armenian practice, which is the older practice, is to count 40 days from January 6th, giving you something like February 14th. So when Christmas comes into the Western church, and again, it's relatively late, it's not an early feast, even in the West. When it comes into the Western church, it begins to be imitated in the East. The Eastern Church is beginning to celebrate something on December 25th. But some of the theologians have a problem. They say, haven't we been all along celebrating January 6th as the day of nativity? What's this December 25th business all about? 
Are we commemorating two different things? Are we tearing our Lord Jesus Christ into a human presence celebrated on the 25th of December and a divine presence on January 6th? Sooner or later, that reservation about the December 25th feast begins to become less and less important. So now we have those two feasts. But again, uh, when we look at the antiquity of the feast, when we look at their ancient rank, when we look at what they celebrate, we can hardly avoid coming to the conclusion that it's this feast of, of the Theophany that's really the highest of the two. After all, what does the 725th commemorate? A birth, the birth of a child. What does January 6th commemorate? The shining forth of the Lord Jesus Christ. The enfleshed moments, his appearance to the world. Uh, that strikes me as probably the most important thing we can notice about this particular feast. Now, as to the gospel of today, very short gospel from St. Matthew. St. Matthew records that our Lord Jesus Christ moved his ministry from Palestine to Galilee. Now, what was Galilee? Galilee of the Gentiles. It was an area settled, not so much by Jews, maybe originally so, but it became occupied as time went on by non-Jewish populations. Even from the very beginning, the Gospels tell us, our Lord's ministry was not concentrated exclusively upon the chosen people. From the very beginning, Christianity showed its universal inclination, its universal mission. Why did our Lord begin to preach in Galilee of the Gentiles? The Gospel again gives us the explanation. It was out of fear of Herod. Herod had heard that his cousin John was in prison. And he feared, and rightfully so, of that prison might face him also if he were to begin his ministry in the same area where John did. Uh, two reasons. One, uh, as Origen, who is a Christian theologian, a very perceptive reader of the, of the scriptures, one of them, uh, Origen, shows us when he observes that the reason why Herod was interested in Jesus, once his cousin John had died, was that it crossed Herod's mind, maybe John is still alive. Maybe this Jesus that people are talking about is, is John the Baptist. And the reason behind that was a physical one. According to Origen, since both our Lord and John the Baptist were related through their human sides to their mother, they probably looked very much alike. So when Herod saw Jesus, he thought immediately of John. And you can see this even the way modern iconography uh, show us the figures of the Baptist and of our Lord Jesus Christ. But the second reason, more significant, is the message that our Lord is preaching at this point in his career. And the message is simple, and the Gospel repeats it. And it's the same message that John the Baptist preached. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Later on, the meaning of the kingdom of heaven will be more and more observed, commentated upon by our Lord, fleshed out, given a greater amount of commentary. But at this point, what he urges upon his particular followers is the same that John urged upon his namely repentance. What do we learn from this gospel? We learn two things. First of all, the road to full human life must begin through the gates of repentance. It's important that the old human being, the old man, the old Adam, our old sins, our old way of life be given up, repented, that we show some sorrow for it. All of us are plagued by shadows of our life. All of us still have some of those past sins clinging to us. We must get rid of it. We must observe that division of repentance. And secondly, beyond repentance is something more important. Beyond repentance is the fullness of the gospel message, which includes union with our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, which includes a sharing in the divine nature, which the fathers call theosis. But that's something that our Lord will 
talk about later on. At this point, at any rate, he and the Baptist are in full agreement. What's necessary for a good human life is the shedding off of the old sins and the adoption of uh, the new man. So during this particular uh, festival period, let us not forget about the importance of repentance as we still begin to celebrate those events of our Lord Jesus Christ's life. To him be glory and honor, now and always, as